Uh, well, the, the all right, we will continue with our worms. Um, uh, I will try and cover as many uh, uh, in a, worms as possible, and if it is not, you've got the next two handouts here, and the lectures are PowerPoint is on the web. Okay, so. Um, you will have all the material. You will be just like the rest of the class then, right? Not hearing me or not hearing me in the class. Um, uh, so um, where we left off was um, what we covered among the um, landworms was Ascaris and, uh, and uh, Trichinella. Um, the one of them is Ascaris, of course, is GI tract uh, infection, whereas the other one is a muscle infection. Uh, muscle worm lives in the muscle uh, as a cyst. Um, what we will uh, 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 do for this hour, we'll start with trichuriasis. Trick means um, Thin, uriasis, ura is sort of refers to the tail, and um, a trick is a thin, thin tail, okay? Um, trick uriasis, uh, thin tail, or thick tail, thick tail. And what they thought at first was that uh, the worm, as you see, is it's a whipworm, it's a, the common name is whipworm, and um, it's primarily a tropical uh, disease, primarily in children. There are cases found in South Carolina, low country particularly. 65% um, of half a million cases seen in Asia and Africa, and the other 35% in the rest of the country, seen in rural South Carolina. Um, causes uh, caused by uh, trichura, trich uh, or uh, trichura, trichura is the full name, and the common name is whipworm. And you'll see why it is called whipworm, because it does look like a whip. And um, um, the, it does look like a worm. It's about um, five centimeters, you know, uh, five centimeters long. Um, the life cycle is a very, very, very simple, just like Oscaris. As a matter of fact, if you could, if you replace these um, with the corticoid round oval eggs, it will be Oscaris life cycle instead. Uh, the transmission is orofecal, okay, and the worm, when it is um, uh, inside the uh, intestine of the host, it produces thousands and thousands of eggs daily. Okay, and those are excreted in this tool to complete the cycle. And you can get it from contaminated food or orofecal transmission, so auto-infection auto as well. And, of course, these things, if there is auto-infection, the worm itself does not multiply, but one worm producing that many eggs, if there's a continuous auto-infection, then you can really increase the number of worms in the body uh, uh, both in this case as well as Ascaris. So, um, they, they, despite not multiplying, they can increase in number in any one individual. Okay? Um, it, the the uh, symptoms are dependent on worm burden. The very, very low um, uh, worm burden may produce very mild symptoms, but the symptoms are, will be abdominal pain because of the presence of the worm, and not only just the presence of the worm. As opposed to uh, Ascaris, this worm does actually bite into the mucosal flesh or mucosal tissue. Uh, so uh, that would cause, um, the presence of the worm would cause, an irritation will cause diarrhea, but uh, because it um, does um, um, bite into the mucosal tissue, as a matter of fact, uses that as a food source as well. Um, there, there will be blood and mucus in the stool. Because of the um, because of the loss of blood, there will be uh, anemia, and the presence of the worm would cause weight loss as well. 
Um, the heavier infection may result in prolapsed rectum, and a very sort of um, heavy infection is uh, represented here. I will turn off the light because uh, then you can really see. Um, You can see it as it is, okay. All right. Um, the worm, presence of worm, that's what I was trying to point to, okay? The presence of the worm. And that's in the extreme cases. Because of the uh, rect uh, rectal uh, irritation, there is a feeling that one needs to empty the bowel, uh, you know, and then, you know, the stress of that would cause the um, prolapse of the. Um, rectum. And here is a higher power, as you can see, worms attached to it. Here is an autopsy of a very, very heavy infection. A very heavy infection um, a case and uh, obviously causing morta uh, mortality. Um, diagnosis is based on symptoms, the diarrhea, mucus, you know, uh, and blood in the urine, weight loss, um, and um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, stool will have very characteristic eggs that are sort of beer barrel shaped, barrel shaped, or you could say American football shaped uh, eggs. Um, oval, slender, oval, and uh, they are plugs uh, that referred to as operculum, and that's where the worm, when it's um, ready to get out of the uh, uh, egg uh, at the time of hatching, uh, this, these pop out and the worm um, can get out. And uh, that is what is present in the fecal material. That's what is the infectious um, uh, stage. That is what is the diagnostic tool. Okay, prevention is obviously sanitary conditions. Sanitary uh, eating habits and improved hygiene are preventive. And um, just like the uh, Ascaris, the uh, treatment is mebendazole. So mebendazole was for both, all three of them so far. Uh, pinworm is the other worm among the uh, roundworms. Um, as opposed to low socioeconomic conditions uh, that favor other worm infections, this is not uh, related to uh, socioeconomic condition. Um, as you will see, uh, it's not a rural uh, disease either. It's spread worldwide, primarily in the, it's in the children, because of, uh, I guess, uh, their, you know, uh, uh, relatively poor um, hygiene. Um, it's an urban disease in the crowded environment, nurseries, schools, uh, daycare centers, um, and the organism is uh, referred to as uh, Entrobius vermicularis. Okay, about one centimeter um, in length, um, uh, and uh, nothing uh, special about it, just like it looks like a maggot. But the uh, transmission is again orofecal. Um, the eggs present either in the um, or something they eat, or a typical scenario is that they are at school sharing food, uh, playing, and one uh, individual, uh, one child is infected and they have not washed their hands after going to the bathroom or whatever, uh, you know, reason they've got a contamination on their hands, and um, they, it can be transmitted to another person because the eggs are present in the fecal material. Um, not only in the fecal material, but as you will see, in the rectal area, they may be present uh, even outside. Okay. Uh, the child is asleep, so during the sleep, of course, there is irritation because of the presence of the worm. They scratch, you know, they get their fingers contaminated, and then they suck that thumb or finger, 
and uh, there's a uh, auto infection continues to increase the number of worms, worm burden. Okay, but primarily it is oral fecal. And when the children are in, uh, infected, they will come home. It is fairly, very, very, very uh, infective, actually. It spreads very quickly uh, in the rest of the family, too. So if you've got children, and uh, you'll see some typical characteristics what may give you a clue as to what um, they are, uh, that they have pinworm, uh, be careful and take extra precaution. Uh, the, the, the worm can uh, lo locate itself in the perineal area or perineal, um, uh, and, veg and they, they, uh, it may even cause vaginal irritation in, girl, in women or girls. In so because of the irritation, there's insomnia and restlessness. And um, one of the cases I was reading, a, a scenario that was presented, a child just very uneasy at school, at the school, uh, can't sit still, scratching himself, uh, his rear end, and um, they, they thought that it was AD, you know, attention deficiency. Sent to the psychiatrist, psychiatrist says, okay, the diagnosis is pinworm infection. Okay? So um, it can be misdiagnosed. Um, as a pediatrician, you will definitely see cases of pinworm infection. Occasionally mid-abdominal pain because of the presence of the worm, uh, nausea and vomiting because of irritation. Primarily, it doesn't bite or consume any uh, blood, like uh, Trichuris, uh, but it is the, it's the hypersensitivity to the worm or the, uh, or the eggs um, that causes irritation. Um, the typical, more, more serious, uh, um, uh, serious um, consequence of worm infection is sort of more psychological, that um, uh, the conscientious housewife mental distress and guilt complex desires to conceal the infection from her mother-in-law in perhaps the most significant, uh, is perhaps the most significant trauma um, caused by this prioritic infection. And uh, typically, as you can see, he cannot keep his hands um, away. and. Uh, and, um, and the grandma says, she simply goes, ah, simply awful, uh, having pinworm. Um, otherwise, there are no serious consequences of it. It is easily tra tra treatable. Um, the only thing is that the, when it is treated, the whole family is often treated because it spreads very quickly. Uh, uh, from the child to the uh, other siblings as well as uh, parents. And um, the diagnosis is based on nocturnal observation because what happens is that the worm migrates out to perianal area and lays eggs there. It does not produce eggs in the uh, uh, in the intestinal tract and the, uh, the eggs being extruded in fecal material. Instead, it um, lays the eggs outside. And uh, that's what this actually causes restlessness, the uh, irritation by the worm crawling and also hypersensitivity to um, the egg and whatever is around the egg. Um, here is the uh, one quick way, sure way of this, that uh, during the night, it usually crawls out at night, and just pull down the pants and flashlight, and there may be worms. Okay? So that is the, that's not an uncommon way of diagnosing it. Um, if one wants to obtain egg, one can also use one, a technique called the scotch tape technique. Very, very high tech. What you do is you take a cover slip or tongue blade, cover slip, I mean a slide, glass slide, you put um, scotch tape with the sticky end on the outside and at the edge. And um, so this is looped and depressed, uh, exposed to the sticky surface, uh, all the, um, against the 
if you can use tongue dispresser uh, or a uh, glass slide, tongue dispresser is a little bit uh, more safe, glass slide may be a little sharp. Okay, hold the tape uh, and slide uh, tongue depressor and uh, then dab it um, in between the cheeks. Okay, and uh, um, in an area, smooth the tape uh, or, uh, uh, you know, and then put it on a glass slide, the tape. And if it is on a glass slide already, you just unfold it and put it the other way and examine the uh, tape, uh, the preparation under the microscope, and you are going to see typical characteristic eggs like that. So they are very much oval, very, very normal egg-shaped uh, eggs. Uh, occasionally you will see, or often you will see, the worm uh, larvae inside the egg. Uh, you have got some of these uh, on your website that is for your independent study. Uh, some of the pictures um, are presented there. The uh, 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 prevention, improved hygiene. The uh, treatment is parental palmoid or uh, you can use mebendazole. Um, that is an alternative. Um, the only thing is, is that after the treatment, there's a routine for it. The treatment, uh, washing all the clothes and the linen in hot water, laundry it, have another dose of the drug, and washing it again. And often the whole family has got to be treated. Okay, that, that's um, pinworm. Uh, the next one is strangyloides, stercularis, or Cochin China diarrhea. It's another uh, the, the disease it causes uh, that's referred to as Cochin China diarrhea. Prevalent in, tropic, in the tropics, uh, Puerto Rico, south, southern parts of the United States are not exempt uh, from having the infections. Okay. So there are cases in South Carolina as well. Um, one of the smallest of the, um, uh, the roundworms, uh, half a, about a, a millimeter or half a millimeter, the life cycle is a little bit different. As opposed to other infections here, this, uh, inf uh, that we have talked about, this is acquired by penetration of the skin. The typical scenario would be one is walking bare feet in the soil uh, where there may be uh, contamination with fecal material and the um, larvae are in the soil. They are going to penetrate the skin, uh, in this case obviously foot skin, and then they are going to migrate from this skin, they are going to migrate all the way into the um, circulation, and from there they, are, they, they penetrate actually the, um, the tissue and then end up directly in the, the GI tract. Not like Oscar is that they have got to be coughed up and then go back. Okay? And in the GI tract they are going to stay, that's their uh, normal abode, and um, they, uh, they produce eggs that are extruded in the um, fecal material. The eggs hatch in the soil and produce larvae. Now these larvae can lay eggs and, um, and um, hatch even in the soil. So there is an extracorporeal uh, cycle as well, outside the body. Um, they can have an independent life cycle in the soil as well. So that, that's, uh, that's another thing that is different about these worms. Um, here's a picture of what their routes are. Actually, okay, they are um, swallowed. Okay, 
so they go around and then the, through the lung, um, they go to trachea and then swallow it back and then go around, go, end up in the skin, in the, in the intestinal tract. Okay, the symptoms are the irritation. As the larvae migrate along the skin, they cause severe inflammatory reaction. And one can see almost the outline of the larvae migrating with inflammation around it. And that would cause the, the, the site of entry, at the site of entry, as well as they, as they migrate, they will cause itching, red blotches, and um, pathogenesis is simply the presence of um, larvae and inflammatory response to those. Um, here is an example here. And there's a track, you know, this, the redness is sort of track and the worm is out here as they migrate through the skin. Um, they would cause verminous pneumonia because when they are in lung, they are going to cause severe irritation. Remember, most of the worm, almost all of them, they increase, they produce an IgE response. So it, they are producing something like type 1 hypersensitivity. Uh, uh, that, would, the, to, that is an inflammatory uh, reaction. And also the adult, uh, the adult worm, um, also uh, the, the presence itself causes irritation. The G, in the GI tract, they are going to produce epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and so forth. Um, and there will be bloody dysentery. Um, and that is due to attachment of the worm and injury to, uh, to the mucosa. Remember, these are invasive. They are evasive in a way because from circulation, they are going into the intestinal tract Okay, and that they are going to get hooked on that, um, uh, hooked to the intestinal mucosa and cause damage there. Okay, generally, general symptoms, uh, weight loss, um, um, some anemia, and that is due to uh, loss of nutrients and blood. Uh, so those are the symptoms uh, in different parts of the body wherever the, the worm is present. The diagnosis is the presence of larvae in the stool, as opposed to the other GI infections with roundworms, where the diagnosis was based on fecal material and looking for an egg. In this case, one looks for the larvae, and the larvae can hatch uh, uh, within the intestinal. The eggs hatch within the intestinal tract and produce larvae. Um, consequently, actually, person to person, the infection is not uh, uncommon either. So the larvae are produced, they are in the fecal material, the hands get contaminated, shaking hands or touching another person can transmit the infection because those larvae are going to um, penetrate the skin. Okay, improved hygiene is preventive, like any other, and Mebendazole or ivermectin is another preparation that can be used. So parental palmoid and ivermectin are the two ex uh, additional drugs so far. You know, otherwise, mebendazole in all cases is the drug of choice. Okay. Uh, a related organ, a related worm is a hookworm, and that's very, very Common, uh, millions of people in, uh, worldwide are infected with that. Um, the organism, in um, appearance, it looks very, very similar to um, uh, the um, strongyloides, uh, except it's a little bit larger, much larger than strongyloides. Um, morphologically, it is very similar to strongyloides. There are two forms of it, ankylostoma, uh, Braz uh, uh, ankylostoma uh, and then the other one is, um, ah, I'll, it will come to me. Okay, so the new world and the old world hookworm. 
Um, the one can distinguish them on the basis of um, uh, the uh, the mouth cavity. One of them has got biting plates, whereas the other one has hooks. Um, and they use these um, to attach themselves to intestinal mucosa as, as well as for uh, biting into the uh, mucosal tissue. And um, that would be ankylostoma duodenale. That was the name. And uh, the other name will come to me in a second. Yes, Nicator americanus, New World. Nicator americanus. Okay, Ankylostoma duodenale has got teeth um, or dentines, whereas the, uh, the Nicator americanus has the uh, plates. The life cycle is very, very, not very similar, but almost identical to the strongyloides. The only exception is that it does not have extracorporeal soil cycle. So it's from person to person. The infection still does occur by the larvae, flariform thin larvae that are the infectious stage. They, they are in this, present in this contaminated soil. Uh, they enter through penetration in exactly the same way as the, um, the ankylostoma, as the strongyloides migrated to the, skin, uh, to the GI tract, they migrate there, they produce eggs there, the eggs hatch in the soil and produce the worm, and that completes the life cycle. Um, the symptoms of the infection are similar to um, strongyloides, except that they are more severe, and it depends on where they are located. If the worm is as it enters the skin um, the, and it's migrating, it will cause erythema, uh, uh, little macular papules, um, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that is referred to as ground itch. Uh, there's a picture later on you're going to see. And that is due to the cutaneous invasion um, of the, um, uh, by, the, by the larvae. Pulmonary, when it's in the lung area, it's going to cause bronchial, uh, pul uh, the uh, verminous pneumonia, uh, irritation, coughing, you know, somewhat... Um, asthma-like symptoms, and that is due to migration of the worm. There is, as it is migrating, it produces eosinophilia. Remember, IgE response to almost all worm infections, okay? And uh, IgE uh, levels will go up, and that, as a consequence of the inflammation produced by IgE, um, uh, there is going to be um, eosinophilia. In the gastrointestinal tract, it will cause um, uh, uh, loss of ap appetite, epigastric pain, gastrointestinal hemorrhage. This is probably, the, not probably, this is the worm that causes most damage to gut mucosa and the largest amount of blood loss. Um, the estimates are, you know, the, uh, with, with uh, about 9 to 10 million uh, cases a year, uh, there is about 7 million pints of, uh, 7 million um, uh, cc's of blood uh, lost every, um, every day, almost. So it is, uh, it is typically, it causes um, most severe anemia among all the, uh, 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 the worm infections. Um, because of the loss of blood, uh, hematologic um, observations would be iron deficiency, anemia, hypoproteinemia because of the loss of protein uh, due to hemorrhage, um, edema, and in severe cases, it may result in heart failure. And this is all due to um, uh, serious blood loss. Okay, here's a picture of ground edge where the worm has entered the, the broken skin and irritation, the, the uh, inflammation of the skin. Uh, here is a picture of, it's of edematous appearance. 
uh, very anemic, uh, stunted growth that um, uh, happens to be an 11-year-old um, child. So it causes um, growth inhibition as well with a serious inf if the, the infection is serious. Uh, the diagnosis is based on finding the very characteristic egg. The, the, the egg has got a segmentation, usually four segments in the three or four segments in the egg. One can almost see it under the microscope. And that's what one would see in the fecal material. Now, contrasting again with strongyloides, here the diagnostic material is egg as opposed to the larvae in the fecal in the stool. Uh, prevention based on um, uh, just sanitation, really. The fecal material should not contaminate the soil. And uh, if you suspect that there is an infested area, one should wear, um, one should not walk around bare feet, really. Uh, there was a case reported actually, it was not a hookworm case, but uh, um, in Alabama, you know, there was a person from Mobile area. Uh, he presented himself with um, um, dog hookworm infection in, the, in the, that case uh, because they, they, they're walking bare feet, dog fecal material, and uh, if the dog is infected with um, uh, canine hookworm, um, they, one can get, um, humans can get infected by that source. Okay, the treatment is, again, mevanazole. Okay, the next um, worm, that's a, a very different from, and that's one worm that you are not going to see indigenous cases in this country. It's primarily in parts of um, uh, Africa, India, Pakistan. Pakistan has been actually cleared now. Uh, there was a big uh, WHO drive to get rid of the, or, or remove the conditions which support this t uh, the uh, drachenculus um, um, infections. Okay, there are about three to five million, mostly now in, it's in South Africa, uh, South, uh, in, in Central America. I'm sorry, Central Africa. It's the, one of the longest um, worms, um, close to 50 to 160 to 120 centimeters long. Uh, very thin, thread-like worm. Uh, the life cycle and the cause of infection is water contaminated with water fleas, cyclops, or water fleas. And um, uh, these cyclops are swimming in the water, and um, they they uh, they harbor the um, larvae, and um, the, an individual um, swimming there or going into the water or picking that water for um, even for um, uh, consumption, drinking or um, uh, or uh, preparing food. Um, the, psych, the worm, the larvae, can, get, uh, can penetrate the skin, and from there, the skin, they are going to, after penetrating the skin, these larvae are going to mature into adult, and they migrate along the skin to different tissues. Okay? They do not necessarily go to GI tract. And as they mature in the skin, they migrate to the superficial area of the skin where there is a blistering and the blister breaks and they, they can extrude their, um, their um, larvae, their larvae into the uh, water. Those larvae are um, taken up by the um, water fleas and the cycle continues. There can be skin infection as well as oral infection by the uh, swallowing of the, the cyclops. Okay, here's a typical characteristic environment in which um, 
the infection with uh, Drachenculus is possible. It's also referred to as guinea worm. Drachenculus is referred to as green, guinea worm, and there are a few other names, uh, exotic names that you have got in your um, handout. Uh, the symptoms, blistering of the skin as the adult worm is surfacing towards the outer part of the skin and uh, causing the blister and uh, uh, for, for uh, perpetuating its life cycle. The abscesses in other tissues, if the worm has died in other tissues, obviously it is going to cause irritation and inflammation. Uh, the, the blistering and the opening of the skin is going to lead to secondary infection. And it's in an environment where you saw that you know, there would be lots of other organisms ready to, uh, to um, invade from the open, through the open skin. Here you can see the worm blister here. Here's another track of the worm. Here is the swelling and inflammation due to the presence of the worm. Here is the removal of the worm. The, the treatment, one of the treatment is actually removal of the worm. And it may take several days to remove. And what one does is that roll it on a um, wooden stick. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? No, it will not come out. It will die. There is drugs. It will die, but leave it. It will be buried there, and it was caused, It will cause serious inflammatory response. Okay, so it will, the uh, removal is uh, extraction is preferred treatment. The way it has been, mebendazole is effective, but the, one does try to remove the worm rather than just uh, treated with the drug. Okay, um, the uh, preventive measure is water treatment. And um, as I said, that um, WHO and Carter Center had a big project to, to eradicate guinea worm, and they have been successful in many countries. Okay, the two next uh, two uh, worms that we will talk about is Toxicara canis and Toxicara cati. And both of them, as the name suggests, they are uh, the worms of uh, round worms of dogs and cats. So they are equivalent of Ascaris or uh, uh, Trichuris, except that they, um, they infect um, humans, um, when the eggs in animal feces are swallowed, larvae migrate to visceral organs and produce inflammatory reaction. Uh, if they, as they migrate, they cause inflammation, so they cause in, uh, blotches and inflammatory skin reactions, um, erythematous blotches in the skin. Uh, but if they, by random migration, they, if they end up in the eye, they can cause blindness. Um, here is a typical scenario that is very conducive to um, the spread of the infection. And here is a capacity in the eye and uh, blindness. Okay, avoid oral fecal contact with cats and dogs is the preventive measure. Uh, and uh, bendazole is effective and one can be effective in killing the worm and one can use prednisone or corticosteroid for uh, controlling the inflammatory uh, inflammation. Last of this series of worms we will talk about is the um, Ankylostoma brasiliensis. Again, it's a, a dog hookworm, uh, and the the, um, if they infect the, uh, 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 when the eggs are swallowed, or they can, larvae can penetrate the skin as well. Um, larvae migrate to the skin, the same, um, um, same uh, sort of symptoms and same um, um, uh, disease uh, they produce as the um, 
Toxicaracanus and caddy. Okay, here is a severe infection with Toxicara, the worms migrating along the skin. Okay, avoid three to oral fecal contact as well as, um, and then the treatment is mebendazole and prednisone. Those were the tissue and GI tract uh, nematodes, tissue and GI tract. Now the, the next few that we're going to talk about is the uh, blood. Uh, the, the, actually, they were, almost all of them were uh, GI tract. They do end up in the tissue and cause tissue symptoms, but the worm is in the GI tract. The um, next few worms that we will talk about is filariae. And these filariae are the true blood um, uh, worms, blood helminths. Bushiraria bancrofti and Brugia malai are two worms that cause elephantiasis. And you'll see why it is uh, called, caused elephantiasis when you see the individuals ex infected with these worms. Oncocerca volvilis that, uh, and loa loa, those are two other filarial worms that cause um, blindness. Uh, Oncocerca volvilis is one of the major causes of blindness in uh, parts of Africa. And loa loa is also present in South, Amer South America. Okay, here is the geographic distribution uh, of um, Bruch, uh, elephant, uh, of um, Bruchereria bancrofti or Brugia malai. Brugia is very much um, confined to the Far East, whereas the um, Bruchereria bancrofti is more universal. Southeast Asia, India, uh, India here, um, some of the islands here, Central Africa, and South America. The, it's about the, the, the adult worm is about 10 centimeter, um, 10 centimeter long, um, and um, whereas the larvae are um, about 250 microns, so they, they can circulate in the in blood. Um, Life cycle is uh, a transmission by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have the, uh, the um, filarial um, larvae, and during the bite, they can transmit into the tissue of the uh, humans, and um, they, there they will mature into an adult worm. And as they mature, and they, some of them may die, they produce very, very severe inflammatory reaction. And the IgE mediated, there's a lot of eosinophilia, and also um, uh, fibrosis of the tissue. And if they happen to be in the lymphatic channel, they can, the fibrosis, severe fibrosis can uh, block the lymphatic channel. And that results in the uh, extreme swelling of the uh, of the extremities, uh, wherever the worm m happens to be, and as you can see, the swelling here of the foot uh, or leg, uh, lower leg, and that is one of the re that's the reason is uh, referred to as elephantiasis. The infected individuals they have the larvae in the blood circulation, and mosquitoes. Um, when they take a blood meal, they can acquire the, um, the uh, larvae and um, continue the circle, so life cycle, continue the cycle. Uh, characteristically, the worms come out, happen, uh, seem to come out. They've got their biological clock. They, ha they come out in circulation during the night. That's the most likely time for the mosquitoes to bite. But from the diagnostic point of view, one takes the blood at night, the blood sample, if one wants to have the best chance of detecting larvae. However, if one sees something like that, you know, one cannot really mistake for anything but um, elephantiasis. And I have seen those individuals with that sort of condition when I was living in India. Here's a 
scrotal um, involvement. And the diagnosis, of course, is based on history, where the person has been, where the person is located, and um, uh, finding the uh, flarial larvae in the blood circulation. As I said, one would take the blood sample at night to maximize the chances. The prevention, avoiding mosquito bites in the endemic areas, and diethylcarbamazine is um, the drug that kills the worm as well as it sterilizes the female so there will be no more, uh, 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 no more larvae produced. The steroid is the, um, uh, would uh, be used to reduce inflammation. Not all cases will end up or do end up in elephantiasis, okay? And the prognosis is much better if there is no elephantiasis and the worm can be uh, treated um, uh, with, uh, worm can be killed with, by treatment with diethylcarbamazine. Um, surgical sort of um, unblocking of the lymphatic channel is another way of doing uh, another treatment. And uh, it helps for the involved patients to move to a colder climate. For some reason, colder climate, in colder cl climate, the symptoms are reduced. Um, okay, that's the, the uh, elephantiasis. Uh, now, Oncocerca volvulus, the cause of river blindness. It's referred to as river, river blindness. And um, the uh, Anco is the major, major cause of blindness in some parts of Africa. And here is the area where it is normally found. There are spots in South America as well. That's where you can see the um, the um, uh, cases of um, onchocerciasis. Um, it depends on the vector fly. In this case, the vector is a uh, black fly. And the uh, organism, about uh, 10 centimeters, or uh, um, oh, no, it's a, it should be millimeters, actually. They're not that long. Okay, so that's the, uh, the organism is very, very thin, thread-like cylindrical uh, uh, worm, and um, it um, is transmitted by the black fly, or the more scientific name is simulium uh, damnosum. Black fly would be enough for you to remember, and during the bite, it transmits the larvae in the, um, in the uh, tissue, and there they mature and they migrate to different areas. So they may produce migrating nodules, nodules um, wherever the worm is. And that is due to inflammation and fibrosis, those nodules. Um, the, the most serious uh, um, consequence of infection is the blindness, if the larvae end up the, in the eye. Uh, in, uh, here are the examples of nodules produced by um, Oncocerca volvulus. Here is an example of severe inflammatory damage to the eye and blindness. Uh, one can find the uh, larvae in the, those um, nodules. And that one sees those nodules, one can take biopsy of those nodules, and see the microfilarial no, uh, no, um, larvae. And the prevention is avoiding, again, uh, the uh, black flies in the endemic area, and diethylcarbamazine is the drug of choice. Suramin is also effective, but the most commonly diethylcarbamazine is used. And the last worm in this um, section is Loa Loa, and I'll finish that and we'll take a break after that. Um, Loa is similar to onchocerciasis. It can also cause blindness, and that is because of the presence of the worm. The 
is confined to central western Africa, and the it is um, the the um, blood um, and tissue form there is about um, a centimeter or so uh, long. Um, the life cycle very similar to Loa Loa. The only difference is. In this case, uh, they are transmitted by deer fly rather than um, black fly. Okay, here's the. They produce wherever they are. They produce um, again nodules because of the inflammation, um, and the nodules may sort of you know there's a very sort of raised area here. It's not very visible in this um, projection but they are nodules and they can move around. And for that reason, they are also uh, referred to as fugitive calabar. I can see a little nodules on my screen, but over here, it's not as obvious. The most serious consequences if they end up in the eye, and just like uh, 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 Uncle Serka, they can also cause blindness. The, the, you can almost see the ones here. Okay, the, the diagnosis is based on, based on history of um, being where the deer fly are infected with that and bite by the deer fly, and then the symptoms, and one can recover worms from the small nodules. The Treatment and precaution is the same as um, those for lower lower uh, diethylcarmosine being the treatment of choice. Okay, so those were the whole bunch of worms that we have talked about. If you look at your last page, you've got a summary page there that describes the characteristic features of that, the what you will need to diagnose it, and I the, I'll end this by saying that. You have got to pay attention to the history and where the person has been. So you've got to know the, where the organisms are, you know, found are, are endemic, and then you've got to know what the mode of transmission is, so that if you can, you know, the patient can describe what conditions they have been through, and then remember the morphology of the worm, general morphology, not the exact size of the worm, uh, and also the diagnostic material. That's the most important part of the, what you've got to really pay attention to is diagnostic material and what you see in that material. In other words, you can see the cord cord egg and you should right away say, okay, that sounds like our, our typical Oscaris. Or football shape, um, the egg, that's Trichuris. Oval and slightly flattened um, on one side, that's pinworm. Entrobius, okay? Segmented egg is hookworm. So from the, uh, the those are the, th the important thing. Uh, for um, strangloides, you've got to remember that it is not the worm that is the diagnostic material, uh, not, not the egg that is diagnostic material, but it is um, the filarial worm, larvae, that are in the fecal material. So those are the important things that you've got to pay attention to.